going to do a quick intro of our first speaker, which is uh, Pastor Nate Wolf. Uh, Nate Wolf attended Take on the World 18 on a whim. Uh, his wife found the conference, and they found it through Mark Sargent. And they were like, hey, let's, let's uh, go to this thing. And they didn't tell anybody of their congregation. They didn't even tell their kids exactly where they were going. They just the city, and somehow through the city, uh, other people discovered, and then they Googled, and it was the only conference going on, uh, and so they kind of pinpoint it, and they go, huh, what's this stuff all about? And It's actually what you call in the Bible gossip, malicious gossip. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have any bones saying that, you know, Yeah. that's, that's what happened, but that's okay. God, the Father has used it for his purpose, mm -hmm. and that's the important thing. Yeah, well, needless to say, the rest of the story goes, Nate came to the conference, and uh, gets fired a few just weeks later. a few weeks later and funny enough uh, you know he called me up and, and we were on our um, uh, anniversary date and and I'm seeing all these calls come through of Nate Wolf and Robbie Davidson and Rick Hummer all these guys going oh you know leaving me messages I'm not listening to them. And then Michael Solomon gives me a call and I'm like Michael's calling me something's got to be going on so eventually I found out uh, it is uh, Nate Wolf got fired, and uh, I felt super bad. So <laughs> I'm introducing Nate as the guy who got fired for truth. Here's his uh, uh, YouTube channel, but we hired him for truth, okay. and he's a speaker. Take on the world 19, and so guys, I'm super excited to bring to you, Mr. Nate Wolf. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm just excited to be here. I'm nobody special. I'm just Nate Wolf. I've always just considered myself just a guy, you know, trying to be decent and orderly and trying to serve you know, serve God as a minister for volunteer and paid uh, ministry for over 26 years. And uh, Chris kind of gave the intro there of what happened to us, but it was in the spring of 2017, probably March, early April, uh, when I got flat smacked uh, by Robbie Davidson's uh, documentary, The Global Lie. And that really threw me for a loop and then because he used scripture. And uh, so I started diving into all kinds of other things. I ended up at Mark Sargent's Flight of Clues and a video or two by ODD TV. Uh, I think it was ODD Reality at the time and several others. I mean, so many, I just can't name them all. And then of course the meetup. And uh, I was called in suddenly, unexpectedly, Friday, September 14th at 8 a.m. I was given a text message that said all of the elders will be meeting with you at the church building at 9 a.m. That was one hour from then. And uh, I thought, hmm, this sounds very uh, unusual. Some of them worked full time still. So to get all five elders together, I knew something big was happening, but I was fired. It, it took them all of about five minutes to slide a piece of paper over to me stating that they were firing me and, and that they, they were aware that I went to this conference and they couldn't have a minister with that kind of association and they couldn't let me in their pulpit Sunday, which floored me. Uh, but most of you have probably seen uh, my interviews on that. If you haven't, go to my YouTube channel, Fire for Truth, and go back to one of the first few videos. The, the first three videos are interviews that I did, uh, one with Robbie Davidson of Celebrate Truth, uh, one was with Nathan Roberts, and one was with Chad Taylor. But what I wanna talk to you about today is kind of a, it's kind of a sneak peek a little bit about uh, the same types of ideas and topics I'll be sharing, uh, speaking at Take on the World. And uh, obviously I come at things from a biblical perspective, from a belief perspective. Uh, I know not everyone are believers, but I, I hope that you'll bear with me. I'm going to share some scripture uh, this afternoon, and I'll try to keep an eye on the time here. Chris will get the, the hook out if he needs to. Uh, but I want to I entitle this, Standing Up for Truth. And when you think about it, coming to unpopular um, truths can be a challenging experience, right? <laughs> Get a few amens on that. Coming to an unpopular truth can be a challenging experience, especially for those who are 100% convinced of what they have learned. And uh, my little brief introduction, you've heard about my story. Uh, after my firing, there were many personal attacks not everyone at the church, but there was a handful of folks at the church that for whatever reason had such a strong reaction, and I believe it was a spiritual reaction, whether they realized it or not. There was anger, uh, there was just rudeness 
And uh, at one point, someone messaged us and, and on my YouTube. They tried to post it as a comment, but thankfully I had it, uh, the comments moderated uh, as approved. And they said, you should just kill yourselves because you're not real Christians anyway. And it was at that point that I realized how serious this spiritual battle was. And uh, this came from a young person who happened to be a member of one of the families that was being very vicious towards us. And I felt bad for that young person because I knew that was, they were just repeating the types of things that they were hearing. And we worked that out, I addressed it, he apologized and, and we moved on. But there were serious attacks, I'm uh, just being completely honest with you. Coming to unpopular truths <laughs> can make you a big target. And uh, there's four challenges I wanna just share with you briefly. When you come to truth, at least I experience these and maybe you'll experience some of these as I've listed them, but challenge number one, it may cost you your job or your ministry. For me, that was, that was a two for one special because I was a fully supported minister at a local congregation. They supported me and, and gave me a salary based on, you know, what was reasonable and what the needs of my family were. And in turn, I was able then to focus 100% of my efforts and energy and to provide for my family and have the freedom to be able to minister and dedicate myself to the congregation and to the community. And so it may cost you your job or your ministry or both. Uh, Chris mentioned that <laughs> at the start. Challenge number two, it may cost you some friendships or even family relationships. We have lost a lot of close friends that happen to be members of the church. And you know, not everybody was angry or upset, but some people just never reached out to us. They just heard that I was fired and it was like we disappeared. It was like we never existed. And uh, I don't know what emotions were going through their mind, but uh, hopefully some of those people will reach out to us at some point. Uh, but the family relationships, uh, my wife and myself, we're, we're blessed that we haven't had super strong negative reactions from family. Some have been supportive. My mom's been very supportive. Some relatives have just not wanted to go there. You know, it's just kind of, how are the kids? What, how's the weather? What you got going on? But they just don't want to broach the subject. And you know what? That's a lot better than screaming, yelling, and you're out of the will and whatever else. So we're thankful that we haven't had that. Uh, challenge as hard as others have had. Some have been completely ousted from their families for simply believing what the Bible and, and even what empirical actual science uh, and our own perception, you know, abilities of perception can, can show us. Challenge number three, it may change your whole family's life situation. <laughs> I can say, yeah, I mean, ask my wife, ask my children who are you know, 21, 19, 17, and 15. And some of them, two of them are still in high school. Two are young adults. And we still live in a small community, 20,000 or less people, where their dad you know, ministered for seven and a half years and then was fired suddenly. Uh, so it may change your whole family situation. It may even cause some difficult family dynamics within your own household, right? Let's be honest, it can happen. In the dead of winter in Toledo, I had a couple of months where every day, you know, I'm, I'm fighting through some of these attacks. I'm feeling pressure, even discouragement at times. Uh, but you know what? I believe that this truth is, is real truth. And I believe that it has impacted others. And my story, uh, really, it's, it's God's story. It's the Father's story of his faithfulness and what he can do when people say, you know what? I am going to stand up for truth. And the Father has your back. So those are just four challenges that I was thinking of. You might be thinking of others. You know, some of you in this room are thinking of completely other challenges I haven't addressed. Some of you watching live can relate. But I want to say this. I give you mostly the bad news first, and I want to end on a positive. But we're in good company, especially if you consider the, the household of faith. Believers across the centuries, we're in good company. I want to read a few scriptures and share uh, four examples, but let's look at Moses. Okay, most of us are familiar with the story of Moses and the children of Israel and the Exodus from Egypt. Uh, you know, Moses, he was raised as, as an Egyptian royal. You know, he had this interesting training and upbringing. Then he left 
and he spent 40 years out in you know Midian uh, as a shepherd and I think God was preparing him you know he got probably had to deal with all these bleeding sheep well he was about to have some bleeding sheep uh, people in the Exodus but he had to return home right after 40 years with a very unpopular message he had to approach uh, you know Pharaoh who was basically the, a God king he was considered the son of Ra okay the son incarnate of the sun god Ra that's what a Pharaoh was considered he was a God man okay and so could you imagine uh, and Moses knew this he knew the the culture right although he was a Hebrew of birth he understood uh, the royal court and all of that he understood what he was up against and he approached this God King and was going to order him around and tell him that the true Most High is saying let my people go uh, and then even when the people were delivered later on guess what some of the many of the people that he helped to deliver they turned against him uh, they grumbled they said stuff like man why did you you know why did you bring us out of Egypt you know at least in Egypt we had our three you know three hots in a cot every day and you know they forgot about the making bricks without straw and whatever else but you know I, I can I'm thinking man uh, how many of us truthers have, have brought someone into truth and then when they start feeling these challenges they're like hey man why did you bring me into this you know most of them once you go flat you don't go back but you know what I'm saying uh, I want to just read from Exodus chapter 5 real quick and I'll try to be brief with these but Exodus 5 1 through 4 Pharaoh uh, this is Moses and Aaron go into Pharaoh's presence and they say thus saith the Lord God of Israel uh, that's uh, Yahuwah okay and uh, he says, let my people go and they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is this Lord? Who is this Yahuwah that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? So, you know, Pharaoh's attitude was, you know, who is this God who's trying to order me to let my people go? And uh, he says that I should obey his voice. He says, I neither know not the Lord will or will I let Israel go? And they said that it was the God of the Hebrews who said, let us go into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. And uh, the king of Egypt said, uh, you basically, he says, you want me to let the people go from their works? I mean, they had built his cities. They were a slave laborer at this point. And he says, get you unto your burdens. Okay, that's the King James. But what he's saying is, you Hebrews get back to work. You know, you ain't going anywhere. Okay, that's the that's the slang version there so Moses uh, what about Jeremiah Jeremiah the young prophet he says you know I don't have a mouth to speak but what does the father tell him he says I'm going to send you to proclaim truth to those who are going to want to kill you <laughs> how's that for a resume and really that's most of the prophets right but he told him he says you know what I'm not going to let them kill you they're going to fight against you but I will not let them kill you. You are going to go speak before these nations. And you know, Jeremiah was physically thrown into a pit, not once, but twice. He spent some time in the hole and he probably thought they were going to kill him. Uh, I want to read just a little bit uh, from Jeremiah chapter one. All right. I'll try not to get too preachy with you, but Jeremiah chapter one. Uh, you know, you have the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah verse four. He says, I formed thee in, in the belly before I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. In other words, I set you apart for my purpose. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. So it wasn't just the one nation, but this was a prophet to the nation. And uh, he said, uh, whatever I command you, you will speak. In verse eight, he says, do not be afraid of them. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. And uh, so, you know, he says in verse 10, I have set you this day over the nations, over kingdoms, to root up, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. So, wow, I mean, Jeremiah had a big job to do, right? And uh, he says that they were going to fight against you. Uh, he says, verse 19, they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. In other words, I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. 
I have appointed you to preach truth, and they're going to do all kinds of stuff to you, and it's going to be difficult, but they're not going to overcome you. And uh, if you remember, too, the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah, the prophet, most uh, likely wrote the book of Lamentations. And read that sometime. It's just three chapters. But read Lamentations, and you can see the picture of Jerusalem. Jeremiah is weeping for the city of Jerusalem. They had gone into idolatry. And just as the father said, he was going to send a warring nation to come in and to take them into captivity and to punish them because they broke his covenant. And read Lamentations, but in that you can see Jeremiah's heart for his people. And he's just, he's weeping at what happened to this great city and to the people. Why? Because they, they left truth. They didn't stand up for truth. And they left the Father, the Most High. They left his covenant, his commandments. They went, you know, after the gods of the nations, right? And they learned a hard lesson. So Moses, Jeremiah, how about Esther? You know, Esther, she stood for truth. In fact, Esther basically said to her uncle Mordecai, said, look, here's the deal. If I go into the king, un you know, uninvited, it could be, you know, the end of me. Because there was a rule that if the king didn't accept, uh, extend his scepter in acceptance of you coming unannounced, that you were dead. And she says, if I die, I die. You know, she was willing to stand up not for only for truth, but she was willing to stand up for her people. Um, and that's a powerful uh, story. You can read about that. But specifically, uh, chapter 4, I want to read just a verse or two. Chapter 4, verse 16 um, she said, go gather all the Jews that are present in uh, Shushan, that's the capital, and fast and neither eat or drink for three days or nights. My maidens will fast likewise. I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So, you know, she is a real strong person of faith who stood up for the truth. And the last example I want to give is Jesus. You know, when we see the Gospels, Jesus was the one who stood up for the most truth, you know, the most truth that has ever been stood up for. And even his own friends and family members at one point accused him of being what? Insane, right? I've been accused of, uh, what was the word? A longtime friend, a few, well, last month, went to a breakfast and uh, delusional, I think was the word that he said I was delusional. And which is real, you know, closely related, close cousins to yeah. lunatic or yeah. crazy. But I want to read Mark uh, chapter 3, verse 21. And this is what the friends uh, said of him. Uh, Jesus, you know, he's, he's sharing, but he's healing and he's Lord of the Sabbath and he's doing all these teachings. And then, and then it says, when his friends heard, they went out to lay hold of him. And it says, for they said, he is beside himself. In other words, we got to grab our boy because he is he's out of it. He's a lunatic. He's crazy. He's got these grandiose, you know, visions of himself. And so even Jesus understood the man, you're insane, you know. That gives me great comfort <laughs> to know that, hey, like I said earlier, we're in good company. If we're standing for truth, we're in good company. And we can just look back. And these are just, these are just a handful of examples that I grabbed. But his own people wanted to kill him and... And they really succeeded in killing him, his physical body. But, uh, man, you know, standing up for truth is not a, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, now, someone has said the task ahead of you is never greater than the power behind you. And I think that's true, but I want to modify that just a little bit because Scripture says in 1 John 4, verse 4, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So, yeah, God is behind us, but really his, his, his power and his love and his spirit is within us. And so we have the greatest ally uh, in this struggle to teach truth. And I want to read this, and I've adapted it. I've taken a couple of these out. You can just Google this online if you want. It's actually by Charles Swindoll uh, out of a book called Living Above the Level of Mediocrity. But it's called The World uh, Needs and it was called Men Who, but I, I'm changing this to The World Needs People Who. So I'm saying this is adapted. The world needs people who cannot be bought, whose word is their bond, who put character above wealth, who possess opinions and a will, 
who are larger than their vocations, who do not hesitate to take chances, who will not lose their individuality in a crowd, who will be as honest in small things as in great things, who will make no compromise with wrong, whose ambitions are not confined to their own selfish desires, who will not say they do it because everybody else does it, who are not ashamed or afraid to stand for the truth when it is unpopular. Wow, that one hits, right? Who can say no with emphasis, although the rest of the world says yes, okay? And I'm thinking of all kinds of stuff, NASA images and all kinds of stuff. But uh, the world needs more people who will have these qualities. And, you know, I talked about the challenges of truth, but there are blessings for truth, okay? I want to end on a positive, right? And I'll be done in a minute or two. But the blessings of truth, you know, as, as Tom mentioned earlier, he quoted John 8, 32, that second part of it, you know, you will know, know the truth and the truth will make you free, right? The truth sets us free from the cloud of error and deception that is in the world. You know, Amber speaks about that or sings about it in all of her songs, you know? It's, it, it just helps us to pull those, you know, scales off our eyes and, and we realize, man, we've been indoctrinated, we've been duped, and it was, it's a planned thing, you know? Uh, Revelation 12, verse nine, you know, Satan, the, the dragon, the serpent, I mean, he deceives the whole world. That's pretty plain. <laughs> That's not just certain people. That includes, yes, even many believers can be deceived. And I think many believers are still deceived to this day in relation to the true nature of creation because they're upholding man's wisdom. They're upholding so-called science, or as the King James says, science falsely called, right? And when you show them the scriptures, what do they do? The first thing they do is say, no, but man showed us this. Man has told us this. We got the pictures, right, Michael? Uh, no, there's no actual pictures. In fact, they can't put, they can't legally put pictures on those images, right? Because they're images, they're composites, they're renderings, they're artwork, you know, and there's some talented artists out there that can paint and draw and make it look like real. I mean, I've seen pictures of fruit, you know, on, in a basket on a table that look like you just reach out and grab it. That's how, how, how many um, talented people, and many of these people aren't even realizing they're part of the deception. They're, all, they're not all malicious actors. Very few are really aware of, of how they're being used to deceive. Uh, so it sets us free, but also truth is life, you know? When we think about Jesus, the ultimate truth is Jesus Christ, right? And he, he is the Messiah. He is the freedom from sin and death. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So the blessings of truth, the ultimate blessing is having a relationship with the true creator of the true creation. And truth is a gift, right? Truth is a gift that, that the Father has given us, but it's also a gift that we give to others, right? And I think sometimes we forget that, you know, we get an encouragement, we get knowledge, we get enlightenment. And then it's kind of like, you know, the little kid singing, you know, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. You know, that little song you sing uh, in Bible class or whatever, church camp. But truth is a gift that we, that not only God gives, but we give to others. And so, you know, I want to challenge us, you know, have, have, we, give, have we received a gift? Do, do we believe we've received a gift? Of knowledge and wisdom and truth if so are we giving that gift to others and it goes back to are we willing to stand up for truth right because I'm not gonna stand up here and say oh no it's just easy you know go ahead and get fired and then everybody's gonna support you and no one's ever gonna say mean things and you'll have hundred thousand you know subscribers in six months and no I don't even have two thousand yet but that's okay uh, so standing up for truth is needed Standing up for truth is worth it, and uh, someone has to do it. What if nobody did? So I just wanna leave you with this question and then a scripture. Are you willing to stand up for truth? I was able to answer that question, and it's not because I'm so great, but it's because I serve a great God who made that way possible. But I wanna encourage you to stand up for truth whatever in whatever circle of influence you have, you know? Some of us, it's jobs. Some of it's, it's just relationships. It's talents and abilities, you know, careers. But I want to leave you with Proverbs 23, verse 23. 
It says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Okay, it's talking about the value of truth. Do everything you can to obtain it, to recognize its value, and don't give it away for anything, right? It's more valuable than anything else out there. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. So, will you stand up for truth? I know if, if you weren't willing to do that, you wouldn't be here, and you probably wouldn't be my Facebook friend because almost all my Facebook friends on this on this page is uh, they're you know they're all believers and truthers and most of them are flat earthers as well so I want to thank you guys I want to thank Chris and Liz for, for giving me this opportunity to speak and we got we got another speaker coming up or okay so I'm just gonna let my little camera run here